Let's see, we'll just check out the board members. Uh, Armstrong, you're here. I'm here. Smith. Here. Milliken. Present. Braxton. Here. And Coles, I think we've lost. Oh, Eldridge, hello. I can see you. Can you hear me, Eldridge? Rob, we were having a little bit of trouble with his uh, audio last week, so he might need assistance. Okay, in the I'll, in the I'll reach out to him. Okay, thank you. Good, Chairman thank Campbell, you. Chairman Campbell, in the meantime, uh, if I might point out one change to the, uh, the agenda is that we are now uh, putting out notice that this is the official board meeting for uh, GRTC Transit System and Ride Finders, as well as the Old Dominion Transit Management Company. Um, which is the staffing arm of GRTC. We, we work basically the same company, but technically there too. So this is the board meeting of that as well. It makes no change. It's just a, just notice that it is all together. Is there a separate corporation here? Technically they are, uh, they are two separate corporations. Yes. One is GRTC, the, uh, the, the agency that, um, manages the, the policy and Old Dominion Transit Management Company, which is the staffing arm. Technically, that's who signs my paycheck. While you hire me, the money goes through a different company. It's a structural and change, but it's all together. This is the way it's always functioned. We're just putting the notice on the agenda. Is that an artifact of the time when we had a separate management company, or is that necessary to have? Is we are working through that, but yes, that is, that is an artifact. Uh-huh. So, hi, Bonnie, I see you nodding your head. Um, are you thinking maybe that doesn't have to be the case in the future? We are looking through it. Um, when the management company ceased to be a vehicle through which GRTC hired management, it was necessary for GRTC to acquire the stock of the operating company uh, and has held, it has held it since that time. I would also note that the GRTC board is also the ride finders board um, and it, the meetings are noticed that way as well so and that clearly serves a different function uh, but yes i'm working with grtc's administration to determine um, whether old dominion still needs to exist and there are some factors as well that are changing in uh, state law that may affect that too All so right. we'll keep you, you up to date Thank you. And Julie, because of that, and I, I know we're the Ride Finders Board, I found out to my surprise after being on it for a year and a half, um, perhaps you and I can have a conversation about uh, at least a perfunctory notice of that at each meeting, um, if in fact that is true. Yeah, and the answer, it is on the, um, the notice now. Um, yeah, I mean, even a, a two sentence report, everything's fine or something like that. But we'll talk about that. All right, public comments, we have none. Uh, Carrie? Good morning, Mr. Chair. We did not receive public comment. For the benefit of all attendees today though, I will explain how to participate in public comment at board meetings. To protect the safety of meeting attendees, this meeting is being conducted through electronic communication means pursuant to and in compliance with the City of Richmond Ordinance Number 2020-093, adopted April 9, 2020. Video and audio of board meetings are streamed live online and recorded for later viewing at GRTC's YouTube channel. Board meeting notices, agendas, and packets are available at GRTC's website, ridegrtc.com. Citizens are welcome to provide their comments in writing in advance to carry.rosepace at ridegrtc.com. The person responsible for receiving comments in writing is Carrie Rosepace, Director of Communications. All written communications received via email prior to 5 p.m. on the day preceding a meeting will be provided to all members of the board the night before the meeting and will be included in the minutes of the meeting. During the public comments portion of the agenda, Carrie Rose Pace will read all comments received by the submission deadline following the two minute speaking time limit normally observed in board meetings. This meeting, I received no submitted comments in writing to be read, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you. Um, I did receive a letter last night from um, a pastor on Brooklyn Park Boulevard, and I don't know if others got that or not. Did you? Or you, you and I will talk about that, or we'll do something on that, Julie. Um, yes, sir. That wasn't part of a public comment for the board meeting. That was a separate public comment that we will be addressing. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, approval of the board minutes. Um, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of the last February 16th meeting? If not, move, could I have move for approval? Second, please. Second. Then moved and seconded that the minutes of the last meeting be approved. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? No. All right. The first item is a presentation on the CBTA by Ms. Torres. Good morning. Good morning. Just to give you guys some uh, high level updates on the various committees um, that have met over the last month. Uh, so the full authority met on February 26th. Um, as far as the finance update, they approved the MOU for fiscal services and financial policies and procedures. And um, the CBT, CBTA task uh, recommended for acceptance the FY21 member spending plan. Um, the CBTA TAC met on February 8th, and um, excuse we have me, been those covering... those spending those spending plans are the individual spending plans for the 50% um, that's um, reserved to the jurisdictions themselves. Yeah, correct? they requested the jurisdictions to list out what they plan on spending. Um, they can be adjusted if needed, but just need to be documented uh, what their plans are. The jurisdiction actually has its own authority. To, to spend Correct. it, nobody has to approve it, yeah, okay. Yeah, it has to just go as far as acceptance. And if, uh, Mr. Campbell, if I may, it's a, the, it, it, there are some stipulations in the law about what applies. It has to be used for a transportation purpose. Um, all jurisdictions as well as GRTC has to then report out on the expenditures on a quarterly or an annual basis uh, to confirm and verify that they are spent for the purposes the legislation allowed. Yeah, the kind of checks and balances for that is the, the audit. So yeah. They'll be audited. Um, the CVTA Act continues to cover many different topics um, as everything kind of still gets to be developed. The Regional Public Transportation Plan uh, will have a presentation later in the board meeting as an action item to go over where we are with that. So I'm not going to cover that in detail. Um, the transmit governance report, we had a kickoff meeting with AECOM on February 19th. Uh, we had a subcommittee meeting on March 12th, um, so last week. And um, in that, they covered kind of what they've learned so far about this baseline um, for GRTC. Uh, we still plan on working with them. There were some financial things that needed to be updated um, that were not correct. Um, and a few other issues that we're still working through. Uh, they are continuing interviews, so those are not done. Um, and they're still doing some data gathering now. The regional project prioritization also has a subcommittee. Um, we meet bi-weekly on that, and that's for the 35% regional funds, trying to come up with the criteria of what's eligible. We're kind of still on, we're on that category right now. And um, just what I talked about with the, the regular committee, uh, just talking about the member spending plan. So the various topics. Um, the finance committee met on March 10th and just some quick high level topics. Um, they talked about the FY22 revenue projection. And then uh, related to GRTC specifically, um, they introduced the, the MLA draft that GRTC worked on. Um, and then there was um, some significant conversation about the distribution of funds uh, for the 200,000 specifically for the regional public transportation plan. Um, and I know Julie was on that call as well, uh, representing GRTC. Uh, future meeting dates, we have the Finance Committee meeting on April 14th, TAC on April 12th, and the full authority meet again on March 26th. Thank you. Questions or comments on this? Um, have we gotten straight yet of uh, the um, legal uh, distribution of all funds to GRTC um, as required, or is that coming up at the next CBTA meeting? If I may, and uh, Adrian, I'll address this one. At the next CBTA meeting, there will be a discussion about the distribution of the GRTC funds. While funds have been flowing to the municipalities for their 50% allocation, the funds to GRTC have not 
been flowing to us yet. I believe that will be clarified at the March 26th meeting uh, that there is no legal stipulation that the funds are contingent upon either the governance uh, study or the regional prioritization. We are, uh, we are under obligation to not spend the money until the projects have been put into a plan. However, the distribution should flow similar to what's being done with each of the jurisdictions and that clarification should come out in the next board meeting. Yeah, it's part of the part of the legislation, so it's not something that can be uh, should be debated. And I assume that the appropriate legal folks will help that to happen. We're we're certainly having those conversations. I believe that there's, you know, it's a new agency, and there's a lot of growing pains and learning curves around what the legislation says and how it applies to each of the uh, the entities. So we're working together through that to make sure that we're 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 dispersing and spending and. Um, reviewing funds appropriately. And we wanna make sure that we have responsible fiscal responsibility for how this flows, it is taxpayer dollars. So everyone's being very cautious and slow and we're working with them to make it happen properly. Thank you. So um, just so that's clear for everybody, we're, GRTC is supposed to receive the funds designated for the 15% for public transit, but is supposed to disperse them uh, only upon specific plans submitted to the, uh, to the CDTA. Right. Yeah, they're just to us. It, the, there's the disbursement and then the, the spending. The disbursement should happen as they're received. Right. They would come to us to hold in a separate account. The authorization to actually spend them is contingent upon approval of our transportation plan. Thank you. And we're trying to get that straight. Right. <coughs> all right. Thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah. For all those committee meetings that you sit through so well and, uh, and try to monitor what's going on, I think. Um, Tim, you're up, Mr. Barham. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I wanted to uh, first go over the uh, KPIs uh, with uh, the on-time performance. Uh, uh, Tim, sure. if I may. Yes. You're you're sharing your calendar. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> you know, we, we we practice this and do it every month, but uh, <laughs> I'll just go ahead. Uh, so uh, with the on-time performance, I know there were some concerns that were raised uh, in regards to that. Uh, we are looking at some initiatives uh, to work towards improvement in that area. Uh, we were at 68% this past month, which is slightly better. Uh, but like I mentioned, we are looking at ways in which we can improve the, uh, the route performance, uh, specifically looking at route by route uh, and segments of routes uh, to see where those issues and, and running time problems may exist uh, so we can make improvements uh, accordingly uh, with the subsequent bookings. Uh, also, we're able to break down uh, operator performance on routes as well to see if there are any uh, ways that we can adjust and make improvements uh, with operator performance. Uh, and it's not just late uh, that affect on-time performance, but it's early trips as well. Uh, you know, early can be just as bad as late. So we want to make sure that we're addressing uh, both the early uh, trips and late trips uh, to improve in that area. Tim, do we have technology that actually tells us when somebody reaches a stop and it gets recorded? Is that? Yes, yes, yes. We do have uh, Clever and uh, the dispatchers in the radio room are able to look and see how uh, the routes are performing uh, and can even uh, radio the operator uh, if they notice that the operator is running uh, extremely late or extremely early. And, and what is the, uh, what's on time? Is it within 60 seconds of the time or, or broader than that? No, there's a, win there's a window actually of one minute early and up to five minutes late. Okay. Uh, anything within that 60 minute window is considered on time. And so we're, we're missing that window um, by about 30% right now. Roughly, yes, so that's yeah, Okay, thank you. Uh, and with our care service, the on-time performance has been holding steady. Uh, this past month, we were at 93%. Uh, the absenteeism rate uh, went down a little bit, uh, we're under 14% uh, as far as operator availability goes. Uh, the new booking uh, helped out with that. Uh, this past January 31st, 
Uh, we were able to reduce the number of runs down to 232. Uh, that put us with 31 operators on the extra board and with more available extra board operators, uh, they gave us more flexibility as far as covered work goes. Uh, lost trips, uh, we did have two days this past month, uh, February 13th and February 18th, uh, due to inclement weather in which we uh, did not run service. Uh, through the entire service day. Uh, well, actually on the 18th, we ran for about 17 minutes, but uh, virtually didn't run at all. Uh, and as a result, uh, you'll see in your board packet, uh, page 16, uh, in which we did have uh, uh, that notice. One correction or one typo, uh, which we will correct, and I do apologize for that. Uh, it showed 897 lost trips for the month of uh, February. Actually, that number is 1,650. Uh, so that will be corrected on the next report. Uh, and like I said, that was primarily due to lost trips uh, on those two inclement weather days. Hey, Tim, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, on the on-time performance, you know, our discussion, you, you know, we saw the drop off with, particularly with the inability to maintain a consistent operator staff. Can you revisit those reasons as to why we remain so so far off on on time performance. Well, uh, you know, it's a couple of factors with that. Uh, in past months, you know, it you know sometimes uh, it has something to do with uh, road conditions, uh, road work, and construction, and so forth. Uh, uh, this past uh, fall, uh, especially, uh, it, huh? affected us you know, with, okay. with, with Broad Street uh, and Thank some you. construction uh, around the area. Uh, so that has something to do with it. And this past uh, fall and winter as well, uh, whenever we have uh, inclement weather, uh, even shut down service, uh, that can impact the service as well. Uh, operator performance, uh, as far as available operators, has more to do with uh, the trips we operate, uh, more so than the on-time performance uh, you know, aspect of it. Uh, but uh, as we make detours, you know, that can make adjustments to the on-time performance as well. Uh, so, uh, so we continue to work in those areas and, and also the early trips. Uh, you know, if a trip runs early, uh, like with some of the express routes, for example, and we understand that with routes, uh, especially this past year with the pandemic and traffic, uh, there's been few uh, traffic delays uh, with more people working from home. Uh, so that has an impact on the early trips. So we have several routes that, that run early uh, as a result, uh, and also with the zero fare. Uh, because there's been less, um, you know, impact as far as, uh, you know, you know, fare box and so forth. People aren't paying fares. Uh, and so that also has an impact on the on-time performance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So are you erring more on the early side than on the late side at the moment, Tim? Uh, it's running, you know, pretty much about, you know, neck and neck. Some routes, like I said, the express routes is more impacted on the early side of it. Uh, and some of the other routes that have uh, those uh, issues with road closures, detours, and so forth, more impactful on the uh, on some of the local service uh, with on the lake side. Have we ever been at eighty percent? Not as far as I know. Uh, we've been in the seventies uh, ago. We were we were over seventy, uh, but we've never reached eighty, at least as far as I can tell. It's been quite a quite a long time. Well, we're counting on the on the seventies to happen in the next <laughs> two or three months here. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know we'll you. I know you guys are working on it. Yes, sir. Um, all right. Is that it? Is that it for your report? Is no, no. I actually have uh, a few more items. All right. Let's go. All right. I'll I'll make it brief. Uh, ridership uh, continues um, with the same trend as far as the uh, COVID effect goes, uh, and also those two days of uh, non-service uh, affected ridership as well. So you'll see that reflected on, uh, on the report. Uh, as far as our staffing, we're at 266 full-time operators, uh, 18 part-time, so a couple dozen under our uh, continuing with our recruitment efforts. Uh, we have a class of five that started back in February, February 16th. Uh, we have interviews this week, uh, with the next class that will start on April the 5th. Uh, and also, uh, I believe we have a trip planned uh, later this week uh, to Fort Lee uh, to help on our recruitment efforts, uh, as I mentioned last month, uh, when it comes to recruiting veterans uh, for uh, mechanics and and, uh, and as far as any COVID-related uh, initiatives, uh, you may have heard of 1B, uh, 
uh, was added to the uh, nation group uh, a few weeks back. Uh, several of our, uh, which includes transit uh, employees, so several of our employees uh, have already taken the uh, first dose. So we're really excited about that. Uh, as we these next few weeks, we hope to get uh, more uh, people uh, engaged uh, in that. Um, myself, I'm scheduled here pretty soon as well. Um, uh, so, you know, for the most part, people, you know, have, you know, just like with everybody else, you know, have, you know, they'll may feel a little bit here or there. Uh, but for the most part, uh, we've been even assisting people uh, with making sure that they uh, do register and sign up and so forth. So uh, we're getting some positive results from that. Well, I understand GRTC has uh, specialized transportation for people who need to get somewhere to get. Yes, that's that's what I was about to mention. Yeah, that's the last thing on my report. Uh, so, yeah. We've been working with the Virginia Department of Health uh, to help people who, who need rides, uh, who, who may not be able to get to a bus stop uh, or who can't. Uh, find transportation on their own. Uh, so we partnered with Userve uh, to help with that. So we want to thank them for, for assisting us with that uh, so that they're able to, to provide uh, those trips for those individuals who need to do so. And um, that's being funded through the uh, CARE Act. So we're, we are making sure that anybody who, need, who needs a ride to get their shot in the metropolitan Richmond area can get there. Yes, yes, we provide... Uh, uh, VDH uh, with all of our uh, information as far as uh, what routes uh, go to the uh, two main uh, vaccination centers, uh, as well as providing assistance uh, with uh, direct door-to-door -door service for those passengers who need it. Excellent. Anything else? No, Mr. unless there are any further questions, that concludes my report. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, we'll be talking a little bit more about the vaccination, um, the the methods of that as far as the extension of it and the possible the funding sources and payment i was able to activate that uh, with the limited authority of the ceo to be able to enact a, a small value to get us going prior to the board meeting because i knew that this would be something of, of import for the board however in order to keep it going i will need board approval later in this meeting cool well thank you and thank you uh, mr Barron, for that report um thorough as always uh, Mr. Carter. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'll be going over the safety performance report for the month of February, found on pages 26 and 27 of the board packet. Um, starting off with the numbers for the month of February, external accidents, we did have 27 accidents in the month of February compared to 33 in the month of January. Non-preventable accidents, we were at 23 in the month of February compared to 26 in the month of January. Bus contact with fixed objects, we had six in the month of February compared to eight in the month of January. Now, as Tim said, we did have two days of, in February that we did not run um, operations due to inclement weather. So to compare apples to apples a little bit, we did more of an analysis and went back to the month of February 2020 just to get an uh, idea of what the uh, numbers were for that month. Um, in the month of February of 2020, we had 41 accidents. One other thing that did step up is, or stand out was the type of accidents that we had. In the month of February of 2020, we had one rear-end accident, meaning a vehicle rear-ended the bus. Um, in the month of February of 2021, we had seven accidents. And we noticed that that type of accident has been trending up in the last couple of months. So what we're doing is meeting with um, maintenance and transportation, we're gonna try to come up with some ideas on how we can reduce those type of accidents from happening. Um, going more of a causal, causal, causation analysis um, on those type of accidents, we're seeing that distracted driving. Um, we've had a couple of situations where the driver of the other vehicle have been impaired. Um, and we wanna also look at some things so far as making the, the back of the bus more visible. Um, we're looking at all those type of things and seeing what we can do to come up with some ideas to reduce those type of accidents. We're also reminding, of course, the operators to remain as safe as possible, still giving them feedback on the type of accidents that they have and allowing them to watch the play-by-play -play, uh, videos of what happens so that they can get coaching feedback from the training staff, as well as um, any type of ideas that they can get or any type of coaching feedback that they can get to reduce the type of accidents. We're having training um, coming up, training videos coming up through our virtual training programs. The first two videos that are gonna be coming out 
they're more for employees all over the company. The active shooter training, as well as the emergency preparedness trainings are gonna be coming out in a couple of weeks. And then following that, we're gonna have a virtual training on defensive driving techniques, as well as safe driving for commercial vehicles. And that'll be aimed towards the operators as well as the maintenance department. We're continuing to do safety blitz to monitor the operations on the street, monitoring the operators and how they're handling the bus to make sure that everybody is safe as possible. And just reminding them to you know, be as safe as possible and give coaching feedback on that. Um, I did want to commend Tim and his staff for the two uh, for the two snowstorms and how they handled their cells and operated, as well as the operators and how they managed the bus. We did have a couple of accidents, but nothing major. And it certainly, you know, was a tribute to Tim's staff and the operators and how they handled the bus during these inclement weather situations. As we transition from inclement weather with the weather storms in February and January, we're moving into the springtime. And that means, you know, days are gonna be longer, temperatures are gonna be rising. And we're gonna to have to share the road with more people as people are starting to come back out and pedestrian traffic, traffic is starting to increase. So we continue to monitor those type things. Also remind the operators to be as safe as possible to pay attention to their surroundings um, and just as monitor as much as they can so that they can avoid any type of situations. And if there are no questions, that concludes the safety performance report for the month of February. Are there any questions um, for Mr. Carter? Yeah, I, I, I remember sitting in a GRTC bus uh, in snow and ice and, and kind of sliding helplessly down the Broad Street Hill to the Saco Bottom until he finally found a curb to stop us. So that's yeah. a, it's a big sled when you got the snow out there. Definitely. Well, thank is. you all um, for, the, for your reports. Thanks, uh, Tony. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Ag, I think we have a, a report on uh, parking lot. Yes, sir. And good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, you will find in the board packet on page 28 and 29, uh, GRTC parking lot resurfacing project. Uh, GRTC headquarters has been located at 301 East Belt Boulevard since 2010. There have been no repairs or rehabilitations to the parking lot facility to date. The asphalt has subsequently eroded and the parking lines have faded, leaving the lot in poor state of repair. On August 19th, 2020, Kimberly Horn was commissioned to develop project specifications for resurfacing GRTC's employee and visitor parking lot, and including Lordy Lane Access Drive. Staff developed and advertised an invitation for bids on January 22nd, 2021. Awarded contractor shall perform parking lot and driveway resurfacing for approximately 104,500 square feet of repairs. That'll include repair, patching various cracks and potholes, replacement of asphalt and parking lot access drives, and striping and marking for the entire entry and exit drives. Um, construction services are scheduled to begin on March 29th, 2021, and will be completed within a two month period no later than May 31st. The GRTC's facilities department will assume on site project management for um, responsibilities for this project. Uh, Kimberly Horn developed an independent cost estimate for the repairs in the amount of 116,700. We did receive three bids. Uh, the bid prices range from 113,000 to 187,000. And the lowest response and responsible bidder is Finley Asphalt and Ceiling, a certified small business. This project will be completely funded with federal, state, and local funds. And the recommendation today is that the Board of Directors authorizes the CEO to issue a one-time purchase order to Finley Asphalt and Ceiling in the amount of 113,615 for the GRTC parking lot resurfacing project. Does this include the, uh, this is the parking lot where people park their cars when they um, come to work and drive. Does it include the, um, the, that lot at the church next door as well? No? It does not include that lot. This Does is just the current employee and visitor parking lot out uh, in Lordy Lane. It's not, it's not also the lot where our bus is parked either. Right? No, 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 okay. Sir. Any questions of this? Can I have a motion to, uh, to uh, approve this expenditure? Move. Please? Second, please. Second. Moved and seconded that, uh, that we authorize the, pay the uh, repaving of the lot as described here 
um, by Mr. Ag. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you. It's been passed and approved. Mr. Taggart, Clever Software Maintenance Agreement. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So our Clever Device System is our core central uh, AVL system for the fixed route side of the operation. It covers our automatic people counters, the computer on the bus, the computer aided dispatch system, Clever Works, which helps manage our bookings. So it is the central nervous system that provides all of the computer um, interconnectivity between our fleet and back to our systems for things as far as dispatching, as well as items such as our mobile app, predictive uh, arrival times, the signs out on, on our pulse platforms. It is the central system. Our maintenance is due. This is our annual maintenance. And this year, the annual maintenance is at a cost of $236,339.16. This will be funded with federal, state, and local funds. And I'm uh, requesting that the board of directors authorize the CEO to enter into this one-year software maintenance and extended hardware agreement with Clever Devices and issue a purchase order for $236,339.16. All right, thank you. Are there any questions of, uh, of Mr. Taggart on this? Comments, I uh, could I have a motion, please. The move. Second. Been moved and seconded that we approve this um, uh, payment to um, Clever. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. It's been approved. Thank you very much. And thanks thank you. for your continual work with this, Mr. Taggart. Um, yes, sir. You're very clever. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> Sorry. So let's see here. Mr. Zinzarella, we have um, our January financial report. Good morning. I'm going to good morning. Morning. screen with you all. Are you, uh, are you well? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm very well, thank you. Good. Yeah, good. Much better than one month makes a big difference. Yeah. Long screen. Can you all see? It's, you can see this up there. We right in front. We have the uh, the GRTC Transit System Source of Funds. Everybody can see that. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So in the board package, uh, there's a combination of, of financial reports and one-page narratives with regards to the performance of revenues and operating expenses. I'm going to go through with you guys the highlights and kind of walk you through these reports. So on the source of funds report, um, as you can see, uh, for the seven months ended January 31st, 2021, revenues are favorable to budget by $459,483,400. On a budget of 35.2 million, so it's favorable by about 1.3 percent. Uh, this is for the seven months here. This has been pretty uh, consistent theme throughout the year. Um, what we're seeing in the directly generated uh, funds, we're showing a positive variance of $229,000 on a budget of 1.1 million, and that's primarily being driven by favorable advertising revenues to the tune of $252,000 as well as uh, total uh, the passenger fares. This is favorable to the university pass program. And this favorability is offset in the other agency revenues. This is uh, lower than anticipated interest income. And this is primarily a result as you have seen in the previous budget uh, uh, financial presentations in the previous months that the cash position was lower than anticipated when the budget was put together. On the uh, local government lines, a little bit unfavorable, about $125,800 unfavorable on a budget of $7.9 million. And that's uh, timing of services primarily driven. Um, still looking into that, we'll have further comments in the next presentation. Uh, on the state government uh, fund level, favorable performance, about $699,000 on a budget of uh, $5.6 million. And that's primarily uh, due to the favorable operating contributions in the state of Virginia in excess of what was contemplated when the budget was put together. On the federal funds line item, um, unfavorable 
uh, $8 million on a budget of 10.5 million. And this is a result of two, two things that are happening. One is, uh, some of the, is the timing of the expenditures uh, versus the budget calendarization for reimbursement, as well as you'll see on the next slide on the operating expenses. We are, we are, we are operating favorable to budgets. Therefore, our reimbursement submissions to the, to the federal government are less as, the, as we have favorable operating expenses. As I indicated before, there's a one pager uh, that kind of takes that that takes this uh, source of funds and breaks it down into into uh, a smaller table uh, that shows the percentages as well as looking at graphically just really high level um, with the variances I just went through and then just kind of a breakdown for uh, your recollection of the uh, percentages in a pie chart of the budgeted sources of funds versus the actual funds. So moving over to the to the eye chart known as the operating expenses, um, basically uh, this this document is broken up into four pieces. You have the vehicle operations sections, you have the vehicle maintenance section, you have the facility maintenance, and then the general administration with a total over here. So for the seven months ended January 2021, operating expenses, as I indicated, are favorable to budget by about $2.94 million. And Primarily, this is on the labor line up top here, and you can see the labor variances being spread between, you know, between basically the three functional areas of the op vehicle operations, vehicle maintenance, and general administrative. On the vehicle operations up here on this line here, eight hundred seventy-two thousand dollars of the of, of the of the labor variances is in the vehicle operations, of which three hundred ninety-five thousand of it is <coughs> associated with operators uh, wages salaries and wages and this is due <coughs> favorable headcount um, and accordingly because the headcount is lower you will also see a favorable variance in the fringe benefit line item uh, due to the sheer reduction in the number of heads uh, in the vehicle maintenance category or section here um, three hundred fifty six thousand dollars of labor variance of which is uh, is uh, two hundred twenty nine thousand of it reflected in uh, favorable maintenance salaries and wages and the remaining 104 just as we saw in operations is in the fringe uh, both of the uh, operator salaries and wage lines uh, based upon the favorable vacancies is offset by overtime as um, overtime is has been increased you know obviously to for route coverage as well as to cover the maintenance demands of the fleet um, coming over to the general administrative line uh, 368.9 thousand of the labor variance of which 162 thousand is in the salaries and the balance of it of 206 is down in the fringe uh, line. Going down to the services line, services is favorable about a million dollars on a budget of 1.85 and this is primarily uh, driven by uh, savings based on zero fares as well as the timing of building, uh, building maintenance versus uh, the budget calendarization. You can see in the first category here, the professional uh, and technical services, you can see here that the BRT fare collection and security services is favorable as those are services that we're not utilizing with the zero fares. And down here in the, uh, in the contract maintenance services area, the BRT station uh, maintenance as well as the building maintenance is favorable uh, to budget. Um, materials and services consumed this category here is uh, unfavorable as you can see here 1.2 million which is due to the higher cleaning and sanitizing expenses due to covid and you'll see the expenses um, in in the in the uh, in the fleet category as well as the maintenance um, and purchase transportation down here on the line here is is favorable in total about 1.55 million. That's due to less uh, demand for services due to COVID. Once again, on the on the uh, one page narrative, you'll see the uh, operating expenses broken down by the functions as well as the component categories that are used in the NTB report. And we have have calculated what the total revenue miles are for the period, as well as what the operating expense per mile, as well as the total revenue hours and the operating expense per revenue uh, per revenue hour. Um, you can see it here as well in a in a bar chart format. And here's some of the high level narratives um, comparing the operating expense per mile relative to the budget versus actual. And as I indicated before, 
uh, the headcount at the end of January 2021, you can see that the transportation and, and I know that Tim has talked about it, that you know, transportation had about 18 vacancies as well as in the equipment and facility maintenance, we're running about nine heads favorable. Looking at the traditional statement of income, you'll, you'll you basically the same you know, revenue variance and then the same overall, uh, the change in that position year to date for the seven months, see that we're positive um, $2.46 million. It's a little different format than what I'd showed you before, but as you look at the components here in the operating revenue, you can see that you know, the advertising revenue is favorable relative to the budget, $250,000 roughly, as well as the uh, customer, uh, the, uh, the past program is favorable to budget. Um, other income, you see the deficit there, that's primarily driven by the interest income as we discussed. Uh, the operating contributions, um, more or less on the timing of the federal, uh, you know, compared to, you know, uh, can, can someone mute their phone? It's a little bit loud. The reduction in expenses. Looking here in the operating expenses, you'll see the equipment and facility maintenance line is on favorable $352,000. That's as we talked about the additional COVID expenses for uh, cleaning and sanitizing the fleet. And you can see the favorable performance throughout the other categories, primarily headcount driven and favorable fringe. But obviously down here on the purchase services, that's just due to the um, lack of demand due to COVID. Moving over to the balance sheet, um, as as you're aware of that, uh, you know, the, you know, from uh, prior year where this was as of June 30th, 2020, you see a strengthening of the balance sheet on the cash line uh, month you know, over prior month, as well as over the period from the, front, from the uh, previous year end. Um, during the, you know, first, uh, let's say five months of the year, there was use of the, of the reserve to help uh, fund operations as, as things were starting to get going with COVID and uh, the incremental expenses and so forth. But you'll see the cash position has strengthened. You'll see that in the cash forecast coming up. Um, item in accounts receivable is, you'll see a rather significant increase. And this is just primarily due to timing. Uh, the November uh, federal reimbursement was billed in January as well as was the January's, the, Jan the uh, excuse me, the December's. The November's was received on February 1st. So there's two months of of the federal reimbursement in the receivables. Uh, increase in PP&E, that's just uh, investments about increase about half a million. The rest is pretty well um, flat relative to the prior month. Going hand in hand with the, as you had, had seen the increase in the cash position, uh, as you can see for the month of January, um, there was a build of about two and a half million dollars in the cash position as the uh, expenses were uh, exceeded by the incoming uh, flow of funds. Looking preliminary at the February close, we see that trend continuing, but we're anticipating another increase in the cash position by about a million dollars. And we expect that trend uh, to pretty much uh, stay consistent through the months of March, April, and May. Um, this uh, kind of covers the highlights of the January 2021 uh, financial uh, presentation. If, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Very thorough report. Beautiful report. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, uh, well explained. Uh, anything you want us to worry about, John? You feeling good about it? Um, I don't see anything. I'm, obviously, I'm still still going through this and, and going through some of the nuances. But I, I think uh, the trend, you're, you're familiar with the trend over the first seven months. I don't see anything that would cause me concern at this point. Um, as you can tell, I'm working with the staff here to as well as uh, you know, Julie and, and Cheryl to kind of refine with the financial KPIs so that they're uh, more readily uh, discernible for both uh, the members of the board, the, the public, as well as uh, the fellow members of the management team. So we'll, we'll be supplementing this probably a little bit more as we go forward and as we learn more. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Tim, do you have anything you want us to know about this? I believe that John summed it up beautifully. All right, thank you. All right, um, next is um, uh, recent and upcoming procurements, Ms. Brown. Your uh, your mic's off. And before before Ms. Brown begins, um, I just wanted to quickly introduce her. She is new to our staff for the past couple of months. Um, she was recruited over to us, and she is helping to refine 
and support Tanya and how we do procurements and our KPIs. I've already seen some wonderful improvements that the team down there, now that they're adequately staffed before they were short staffed, um, are able to do. Uh, it's amazing when you have the resources to, to work together what you can do. And so Shonda has really, I believe, been supporting Tanya in, in making that group a, more highly functional than when it was short staffed. Thank you uh, and welcome. Thank you. So good morning. Um, from page 42 of the bid packet, you'll see that there were quite a few um, upcoming procurements for our team. And since the last board meeting that Ms. Coles shared the report with you, we've added four additional line items, um, three of which are with information systems. Um, Rob and his team will manage those. The first being Clever Vision. Uh, this is projected at 1.1 million and also estimated to be awarded in spring of 2021. The Clear Vision, Clear Vision Project, um, it installs the screens um, on each of the buses providing real-time information as well as targeted advertising. The next project that Information System has is Clever Smart Yard and it's projected at $550,000, also projected to be awarded in spring of 2021. The Clever Smart Yard is intelligence for the management of vehicles at the depot, and it also assigns operators to the correct buses. The third line item for information systems is Clever Secure Buses, projected at $400,000, also looking to award it spring 2021. This, the Clever Secure Buses will secure buses from being started or moved um, without the authorization of the, the bus driver's employee, employee badge or a PIN number. Um, it, it's also tied to the Clever Smart Yard and it will prevent operators from not leaving out of the depot with the incorrect buses. The last project that we have is an ongoing project and it is F the operator recruitment media buying. The marketing team, Carrie, Carrie and her team will be managing this project. It's estimated of about $300,000 to $400,000. And it's continually um, the search for qualified bus operators. So they'll be using this funds for marketing and advertisement to recruit new um, bus operators. This line item is pending FY22 budget approval. And those are all of the additional line items added since the last board meeting in February. Are there any questions? Um, what needs to be approved here? Anything, Julie? How does this work? No, sir. This the the. I'm sorry, Shana. Did you want to jump in, please? Oh no, no, it's okay. Nothing. This is just um, making awareness to the board about the projects that are upcoming. Nothing has been advertised publicly yet. Um, this is just an announcement of what we will be working on. Um, the team, the procurement team here will be working really closely with information systems and marketing to get the solicitations prepared for advertisement. So once they're advertised and you guys pick a, a vendor, then we, um, well, we know uh, Clever is all one vendor, right? But anyway, then we approve the expenditures and how it works. Absolutely. It'll be much like the reports that you've seen from I believe Joseph and um, I think oh and Rob today for Clever you'll see those board action documents. So how about how about Rob. these first six that we have listed? Um, do they come first to us at some point? Uh, the ones we didn't discuss: roof repairs, interior painting, station mod assessment, and so on. Absolutely. Well, if I might make uh, one caveat to that, they do come to you if they're over fifty thousand dollars. So if they're under $50,000, they're within my authority to enact. But at any rate, this is a list of anticipated things that have not yet come for final approval to the board. Right? That is correct. Okay. Thank you very much for your report. If I might add to that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, and thank you. Thank you, Shana. That was awesome. Um, the, the reason for the report is, is multifold. Everything that uh, Ms. Brown said, but also it's the report that provides information that should there have been a procurement that was approved by the CEO and the chair, that would also uh, uh, yeah. that would come on this report. And also, by providing this information early to the public and the board, 
It gives you an opportunity to see what's coming to make sure that we are in a line with policy prior to solicitation. It allows the public to know what solicitations are coming up in case they might want to participate. And it also allows us to, um, to increase our ability to get uh, disadvantaged businesses, minority business, women-owned businesses, a kind of a, uh, an open door to know what's coming. Um, and should there be small businesses out there that might not have as much um, ability to participate, early identification of these projects gives them a little bit of an advantage to participate with the higher <coughs> economically advantaged firm. So there's a lot of that goes into why we want to make sure we get this information out early and well. Yeah, I'm glad to see it. Um, just wanted to uh, make sure I understood what I was looking at. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, I think that's it um, for this. We now have um, What's this? This is a uh, regional transportation plan. Ah, Ms. Torres and Scudder Wag. Oh. Yes, good morning. good morning again. We are gonna kind of, uh, I'll intro it and Scudder will jump in and update you on uh, what we've done since the last board meeting. We have a presentation. I'm working on my screen share. I'm having a momentary <laughs> problem with it as usual. I apologize. Oh. Hold on just a moment. Is this the Tories WAG team or the WAG Tories team? Uh, Either. I'm going to have to go with Tories. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, while he pulls it up, I'll go ahead and just kind of introduce what, we, what we've done as far as public engagement. Um, we began outreach on February 18th, so right after the last board meeting. We put out our survey and went live, um, as well as we have uh, lots of details on the various concepts, um, on the plan itself, uh, on our website. So we have a dedicated web page for that. Okay. Um, we had a stakeholder meeting on February 23rd where we did a PowerPoint of what was done so far, um, the concept, and this was with a group of community leaders. We had a public meeting on March 4th and we had a pretty good um, turnout of 30 plus attendees. Um, and as far as our survey, it was open for three weeks. So it closed actually just past Friday on March 12th. Uh, it was even more than we had anticipated. We were hoping for around 150 respondents minimum, and we had 420. Um, so we were very happy with that turnout. Um, and it was a mixture. It was online, like I said, um, we did it through SurveyMonkey, um, but marketing actually went out in person at some of our more frequent bus stops to make sure we were still capturing uh, writers. So they took a tablet out and actually uh, had people take the survey out there too. So Scudder's gonna get into uh, the concept and overview again, as well as the results of the survey so you guys can see what the public said. Now, specifically what we're dealing with here is the regional transportation plan um, proposal that we'll be making ultimately with uh, the TPO to um, CVTA, correct? For the... Yeah, so the purpose of this was to show the concept that we had designed with the MPO, um, with the jurisdictions, um, get some actual feedback from writers, nine writers, you'll see it's a mix, so that when we're making it, when you guys are making a decision, a policy decision, as well as the jurisdictions could see what the public had to say throughout this process, so just another input throughout the whole thing. And this is the first time we've ever had to do this like this, so we're really working at it to get it right. Yeah. Yes, this is a um, new process. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Adriana. I'll uh, jump in and go through the concepts again and the, the responses. Apologize for the technical drop off and come back on. Um, so just to rem I want to just start off with a reminder of what the concepts look like. What are the differences between them? So everyone understands the differences. And um, as uh, you alluded to, uh, Mr. Chairman, the um, the intention of this is to get uh, ultimately get this, your, this board to uh, make a recommendation in some form about how to allocate the CVTA dollars towards ridership goals versus coverage goals across the region. And that's the intention of this concepts process was to get input from the public and riders on that. So these two maps that we uh, have been showing to the public over the last month uh, identify the differences between uh, what you do, the ridership concept would put 
100% of the regional CVTA dollars towards high ridership goals. The coverage concept would put 70% towards high ridership goals and 30% towards coverage goals. And what that looks like in terms of the differences across the region, if you look at kind of the northern and eastern parts of the region, you see the differences of in the ridership concept, Route 7 is every 15 minutes from downtown to Laburnum, which is a, a doubling of the frequency. Um, alternatively, in the coverage concept, that Route 7 is kept at, at 30 minutes on that trunk hourly on the branches. And Route 14 is extended out Williamsburg Road to the airport every 30 minutes to provide additional coverage. So that's a, an effective trade-off there. Um, within the city, Route 39 in, is, remains in the coverage concept as opposed to in the ridership concept, Route 5 is turned up to every 10 minutes in conjunction with changes on the removal of Route 77 from the museum district and the fan and its consolidation with Route 5 within the city in order to afford that 10 minute frequency. Uh, the ridership concept has a 30 minute service extension up Brook Road from Chamberlain Wilmer to Brook Parham, um, as opposed to the coverage concept extends that service hourly all the way up to Virginia Center Commons. Relatedly, there is an extension of service out to Memorial Regional Hospital every hour in the coverage concept. So these are you know, the basic trade-offs between um, you know, spending our dollars in a, in a coverage way versus a ridership way. When we look to the south side of the city and into Chesterfield County, the ridership concept is investing more generally in frequency in the busiest places. So you have a 30 minute extension out Midlothian Turnpike to Chesterfield Town Center. You have a, a rejiggering of Route 2B and Route 1C to get 30 minute service on Hull Street all the way to Chippenham Mall, um, all the way to Chippenham Parkway there and Route 2B taking over where, where Route 1B serves Warwick today. Um, and then a 10 minute service on the trunk of Chamberlain and Hall Street through the city from Southside Plaza to Chamberlain Wilmer as an investment in additional frequency in the busiest parts of the region. Compare that to in the coverage concept, um, instead of having that 10 minute frequency on that trunk of Chamberlain and Hall Street through the core of the city and the region, um, you invest instead in hourly service into the less dense parts of the region in the South Richmond with these routes 84, 85, and 86 that extend down into Wilkinson Terrace, down to Chesterfield Government Center, and into Meadowdale Boulevard with hourly service. And an extension of Hull Street every hour all the way to Commonwealth, um, Commonwealth Center. The coverage concept keeps the Midlothian service every 30 minutes to Chesterfield Town Center. That's a common thing in both concepts, which is effectively saying that we think that's a, a recommendation that you would do really in either, in either case. And then um, if we look to the, the west end of the city and Henrico and compare um, the, the differences here in the ridership concept, we're investing in more frequency in one of the busiest and, and most active suburban uh, jobs corridors, the Broad Street corridor, turning that up to every 20 minutes uh, from every 30 minutes today, and turning up the frequency on the 18 and 79 corridors, the Staples Mill and the uh, outer Patterson three chomp corridors to every 30 minutes and actually joining those into a West End circulator. Um, you could actually call that the hospital circulator because it touches three hospitals out in the West End of the, of the region. Um, a reminder as well that ridership concept consolidates Route 77 into Route 5 in order to provide 10 minute frequency from Carytown to VCU to downtown and onward to Whitcomb um, and provides 30 minute, a 30 minute extension off of that route to go to U of R. Um, so that is a, a, you know, a change in how that route and that service would function as part of this ridership concept. Alternatively, the coverage concept in this area extends the 18 and 79, it runs them at a 60 minute frequency on the, that three chopped outer Patterson corridor and Staples Mill corridors and extends them all the way to Innsbruck, providing additional coverage to places that don't have service today at the expense of frequency and only has 30 minute service on Broad Street, but does extend that service a little farther into Goochland. So those are the basic breakdowns uh, between the differences and you can kind of you can think of many of these as kind of trade-offs, uh, individual trade-offs, like that that Route Seven increase in frequency versus extension of the 14 in the East End is kind of, you know, if you're going to go the ridership direction, 
in the east end, you would do the Route 7 increase in frequency. If you're going to go in the coverage direction, you would extend the 14. So some of these you can think of as individual trade-offs. Um, how did the public respond? Um, of those 400 respondents, uh, about half were riders. So just quickly looking at the demographics here, about half of them were occasional or regular riders. Um, they were uh, slightly more men than women responded, about 53% uh, uh, men, about 45% women responded. So slight over representation of men, but not dramatic here. Um, and a pretty broad breakdown of, of age groups, a slight over representation of what you might call kind of core working age populations, 25 to 54, um, a bit of underrepresentation among younger people, um, but reasonable representation among older um, respondents relative to the regional demographics. When you look at race and ethnicity, um, about 60% of respondents were white, about 30% identified as African American or black, about 5% Hispanic Latino. Um, these are relatively similar to overall regional demographics, but obviously compared to existing riders, this is highly overrepresentative of, of whites um, in terms of race and ethnicity. And then we look at household income of respondents. Um, almost 35% were over, uh, reported over 100,000 uh, household income. Um, Relatively fewer, less than 5% were in the three lowest income categories, which we know are um, the categories that are most common among your existing riders. So um, this is a bit overrepresentative among high income groups. I would note, however, that um, many people did not uh, answer the question on income, which is an unfortunately common thing we see in surveys of people not wanting to report their income. So of the 420 people who responded to the survey, only 291 uh, indicated their income. And then in terms of the jurisdictions of respondents, we've estimated their jurisdiction based on the zip code that people provided in their response. 371 people provided the zip code. Um, and looking at the zip codes, we estimated about 60% of respondents uh, came from within the city of Richmond, a little less than 20% from Chesterfield and about 15% from Henrico. So uh, a sizable portion coming from um, Richmond when we look at that. So how did people respond to the ridership coverage question? They were asked, do you strongly prefer ridership? Do you lean towards ridership? Are you halfway in between? Do you lean towards coverage or do you strongly prefer coverage? Um, and so we've summarized those into, did you prefer ridership? Were you on that ridership end uh, strongly or lean towards ridership? We've consolidated that or did you strongly or lean towards coverage or were you in between? When we look at that response by ridership. Um, occasional or regular riders were similar to non-riders in preferring ridership about 45% to coverage of around 35%. Um, non-riders had a, sl a somewhat more uh, in-between response than, than riders did at uh, about 15% for uh, riders and about 21% for non-riders. So not a big divergence in response between riders and non-riders on that. When we look at jurisdiction, there is a bit of a divergence. Um, respondents from Richmond and Henrico were stronger in preferring ridership, close to 50%, um, versus only 30% from Chesterfield preferring ridership. And Chesterfield respondents more than 50% preferring coverage versus about 35% from Henrico and Richmond. I will caveat this, of course, that um, Chesterfield and Henrico respondents in total were around 60 to 70 each. So these are relatively small numbers of respondents when we're talking about the uh, Henrico and Chesterfield numbers here. Um, by age, there was not a, a significantly dramatic difference in respondents to ridership and coverage by age. Um, we have categorize these as 55 plus in orange, 35 to 54, which is kind of core working age in green and under 35 in blue in order to have a you know, large enough numbers uh, in each category. Um, there's not a really large divergence by age here between 40 and 50% preferring uh, ridership uh, among all age groups and uh, between 35 and 40% preferring coverage in all age groups. There is a bit of a divergence when we look at, when we split up the response by uh, race ethnicity. Um, if we look at the total respondents in orange here, we see total respondents about 45% preferring ridership, 35% preferring coverage. Um, African-American respondents though, 
only 30% preferring ridership and uh, about 48% preferring coverage. Uh, white respondents, the reverse, uh, more than 50% preferring ridership, uh, about 30% preferring coverage. And uh, between 15 and 20% of each group about, uh, right in the middle. And then lastly, by income, we see a similar divergence um, in terms of higher income groups shown in orange here, preferring ridership, almost 60% of the highest income group over 100,000 preferring ridership, um, about 30% preferring coverage. Uh, looking at that, that middle income group of 50,000 to 90,000, which is actually hot, still higher than area median income. Area median income across the whole region is 50,000. Um, preferring uh, ridership about 50% to 30%. And then lowest income respondents, those under 50,000, which would uh, constitute people below area median income, 30% um, preferring ridership and about 45% preferring or 48% preferring um, coverage. So this is uh, obviously ultimately um, a self-selected survey of respondents. Um, it is advisory uh, information to you, to the, the working group about um, helping you to think about what you know, writers, what uh, respondents uh, across the region are thinking about these concepts. And you know, the, the desire here is to have, a, have this board provide some direction um, about you know, what, what is the breakdown in dollars to be spent and uh, resources to be spent out of that CVTA bucket. So to just remind everyone what we're talking about is the, this ridership coverage decision is really about this part of the funding pie. There's kind of three big pieces of the funding pie. There's the federal, state, and self-generated revenues that GRTC gets. There's the lowest local jurisdiction investment. And then there's now the CVTA investment. Um, and this ridership coverage decision is directly related to just this piece of the pie of how these regional dollars ought to be invested. So um, we spent a lot of time um, yesterday with that working group um, talking about these responses, talking about their preferences, um, and talking about how they would like to see this split um, between 100% ridership and 70% 30% split. Um, the city of Richmond staff said they and their leadership strongly uh, favored ridership, um, were willing to come down, uh, you know, in between, but certainly wanted to be generally closer to the ridership concept. Um, Henrenko staff, um, in general, wanted to lean towards the ridership as well. Um, and as we talked about specific um, route uh, differences between the ridership and the coverage concepts. They generally felt that the ridership investments for routes in their jurisdiction were the better way to go. Um, and Hanover staff didn't have any particular uh, opinion, strong opinion on the, on the matter. Um, and then Chesterfield staff uh, indicated that they and their leadership have generally preferred the coverage concept. So Scudder, there was one route that went into Hanover in the coverage mm -hmm. concept. There, yes. there was no interest in that from them. They did not express really strong interest in that service. No, yeah. um, I went to they, the uh, Bon Secours um, yeah, Hanover Medical Memorial, Center. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the the Hanover staff, the way they described their thinking is they certainly see the potential value of that service. They see um, the primary potential use for transit in Hanover as bringing potential workers to. Hanover from other jurisdictions, um, and you know, service to Memorial Regional would be a prime candidate for that kind of service. They don't see uh, significant interest or desire for other services geared towards taking people, commuters, for example, from Hanover into the into other jurisdictions or uh, fixed route services in in between places in Hanover. So, um, but they don't have a strong desire or opinion to to even have any service or anything yeah thank you so um you know this is the opportunity to get your input and consideration um uh, talking with uh, uh miss tim and, and adrian we understand that there's some interest in possibly having a more detailed work session on the 22nd to really talk through this uh, kind of route by route in more detail uh, but what we ultimately do want to try to get uh, out of this discussion is a, a recommendation from this board that can be part of the policy of this um, regional transit plan 
that says for the CVA dollars, we want to spend them um, 100% ridership, 0% coverage, 90% ridership, 10% coverage, 80, 20, 70, 30, one of those splits effectively is what we want to get as a policy direction um, in this process. So with that, I'll, I think I don't have anything else to add, but happy to take questions. Did, um, I, I must say, Scudder, I did not understand when I uh, saw your two excellent um, public presentations on this, that it was 100% ridership versus 70% ridership. I thought you were doing samples um, um, which was closer to 100% coverage and 100% ridership. So um, that's uh, that was a confusion to me. Do you have any indication when we when we look at the um, qualifications or changes to your 100% coverage proposal, I mean 100% ridership proposal? Do you have any indications of the areas in which? Um, people were most uh, concerned about some some fall off to that that is roots on your coverage map mm -hmm. that that most likely wanted to be picked up from the survey there were not many specific route uh, I did, routes identified in the open-ended comments that people uh, suggested what I saw as a common theme among people who said they preferred coverage was often just a general sense of we want to extend service across the region as far as possible. Um, so there were not many in direct things uh, that people asked for. There was one comment that specifically asked to keep the 39. Um, there, I believe, was one comment related to the 14 and the desire to have that extension out um, Williamsburg. Um, there were uh, this is sort of tangential, but there were a couple of comments related to the, the 4A, 4B, and the, the current uh, scheduling and the pandemic condition of those only being hourly right now, and a lot of frustration with that, but that's a separate, you know, issue. Oh. Um, and then quite a few, you know, requests for more shelters and amenities and, and so on in the, in the comments. All right. Um, other board members, do you have any um, questions or thoughts yes. you'd like to put on this? Yes. Um, uh, Scott, could you go back to the slide that showed um, income? Yes. Um, income in, in the voting. I, I, I didn't take the number down. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. Well, okay. Go back to the, uh, this was 17. This one I remember. Go oh, the, the total the respondents by income? Yeah. I'll go back to the one with race. I'm sorry. That, uh, broke down um, the demographics as as to how they voted mm -hmm. one way or the other. There we go. should have taken a picture. Okay. Yeah. And a reminder, um, of course, not everyone answered every question. So the orange bar on this chart is showing you the total 419 responses to the ridership coverage question. Mm -hmm. The blue and green bars, which are telling you how minority respondents um, primarily African-American black respondents, because that's the vast majority of people who identified um, the, as non-white. Um, those two bars are only 340 respondents because quite a few people just didn't answer any of the demographic questions at all. Okay, so there's only 340 respondents. And I mean, this was the one, you know, everything just sort of clicked along in, until I saw this, mm -hmm. right? And um, it really, because the juxtaposition between this jurisdiction and now let's go back to the next one 17 the by income yes mm -hmm. right there. okay yeah same thing george um, yeah yeah Just really took me by surprise okay, okay thank you I, I i don't have any questions beyond that just uh just getting a better look at um, look at this. I just mm -hmm. feel that because of the numbers and the number of differences and responses and all that, um, it's it, it's hard to pull anything definitive, you know, yeah. from this. You know, it's just uh, um, it just uh, you just sort of put an asterisk beside what you think you believe and and then see what else 
happens from there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, in my experience, you know, public survey responses are are can be somewhat helpful in just trying to see what may be some differences of opinion in in you know from different groups. Um, rarely is it definitively telling you what you should do. Um, so this this is certainly an, an important divergence to think about in terms of the differences of opinion here. Yeah, what you always hope for is confirmation and what you think, what you already believe. Right, and right. I just didn't get that. Right, from, <laughs> from right. Confirmation nor, um, you know, uh, total disagreement. So it's, that's the only thing. So, okay. Um, other board members. Um, hey, hey yep. Cutter, this is yes. Gary Armstrong. Um, I'm curious about the, you know, obviously we have a discrepancy between how the localities with a significant amount of service versus say Chesterfield and their viewpoint on what they would like to see in terms of CVTA money going towards. Um, and am I right in thinking that I have a, I have a more, I have a less dense area or less dense corridors that Chesterfield would consider in expanding. You know, is that kind of where a lot of that resides, in your opinion? Let me see if I understand what you're asking. You're, are you asking whether there are fewer ripe corridors in terms of density and, and activity and, and jobs within Chesterfield for transit? Is that what you're asking? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, some of those main corridors seemingly would be would appear less dense from that standpoint. So I'm I'm kind of getting your feel for, you know, how we need to think about this as we go into a work session. Sure. Yeah. I mean, when you look at the maps of activity density, of job density, of, of residential density, uh, all of those factors, which are key components of potential ridership, um, they most corridors in Chesterfield are less dense than, you know, comparable corridors, say, in, in Henrico. Um, um, obviously, much more dense than places in, in, in outer jurisdictions, but, but less so than in the city of Richmond. Um, the, the Midlothian corridor, which is, we have the same service levels in both of these concepts, um, is the highest density job and activity corridor in, uh, in Chesterfield. Um, Hall Street is significantly less so. You obviously have a significant pocket of, of job density and, and somewhat of residential density at Brander Mill area, but in between there and, and Chippenham, there's the density level is much, much lower. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then you also look at the walkability factors as well. Um, you know, many of these corridors, both in Henrico and Chesterfield have significant challenges with walkability, with being able to cross the street safely. Those mm -hmm. tend to be a bit worse on um, uh, Hall Street, on Iron Bridge, for example, and even Midlothian compared to, uh, say, Broad Street or Seven Pines or, uh, you know, other corridors, uh, Brook Road, even in, in Henrico, a little bit worse. So when we when we think about those four ridership factors, density, walkability, linearity, and proximity, uh, most of the quarters in Chesterfield are just a little, are not as good. Right, okay, thank you. Eldridge, Danny, um, Ian, any of you have anything to say on this? I've got a quick question. Um, Scudder, for the, the surveys, when we're talking about ridership versus coverage, we're really talking about 100% rider, ridership model versus a 70% ridership model, right? So mm -hmm. we weren't ever actually investigating a hundred percent coverage model because that just wouldn't make sense. Right. And, um, you know, to be clear about kind of why we came down to, to that level is we're, we're talking really just about that blue piece of the pie um, that I pointed out, the CVTA portion of the funding. Um, there's a whole lot of other service that will ultimately be paid for by localities that is much more coverage oriented. And a general sense from, from the working group was uh, from the start that regional dollars should be paying for service um, on major regional corridors, first of all, which are high ridership territory generally, you know, high. So therefore, um, you know, that slice of the pie is naturally, if that is the, 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 if that is a starting assumption is naturally going to be, you know, more ridership oriented than, than coverage oriented. 
Gotcha. And that, that makes sense. Um, and when you're looking at the, uh, the, the coverage areas for Chesterfield mm -hmm. and you're identifying those origins destinations of what makes sense to, to put bus stops and everything, is part of the, the thought process, if you have like almost like a, a park and ride type you know, facility where you can have commuters that would commute in from other areas of the county to park and then uh, take the bus into the, the city to, to jobs and things like that? No, the, the, the primary emphasis in the coverage service that is drawn, and this is a, just, again, going back to the sample of the coverage concept uh, for South Richmond and, um, and Chesterfield here, is more on um, local, locally oriented service reaching uh, pockets of low income residents um, in particular, who we know are much more likely to ride transit. And from a need perspective, we've tended to prioritize you know, needs for service with that coverage. So this, this 84 route that's drawn in the coverage concept going down to this uh, Belmont Road quarter, Wilkinson Terrace area, that's a pretty significant, uh, relatively dense area of apartments with, with low income populations. Um, the similarly with this 86 route that we've drawn down Meadowdale, that is going through a pretty significant pocket of relatively high density for Cher Chesterfield and also low income. So it's more prioritized towards those need factors. Um, and those will actually generally outperform um, on productivity terms, um, commuter oriented service as well. Other thoughts and questions? Uh, when Chesterfield um, folks um, discuss this, what was their next priority from what you have on ridership? So yeah, the discussion yesterday kind of boiled down to ultimately um, in, in the ridership concept and the coverage concept in Chesterfield and South Richmond, um, the trade-off really ends up boiling down to could you afford 10 minute service on the Hall Street and Chamberlain corridors in the city versus could you afford some of these coverage oriented routes that go into South Richmond and, um, and Chesterfield. Uh, and they indicated uh, their priorities would be for um, this 86 uh, corridor that is uh, coming out Walmsley to Meadowdale would be their number one priority for extended coverage. Well, their number one priority overall, they said is Midlothian, um, but we're pretty confident that's gonna be in the plan uh, no matter what. Uh, but beyond that, the, this Meadowdale Boulevard service and um, is, a, is their next highest priority. That would be their next one. Yeah, yeah and then the 84 um, service going down Belmont to Wilkinson Terrace would be their, their second priority beyond that. And then this 85 corridor going down Iron Bridge to the government center um, was their third priority. Um, and then la the last priority they identified would be the Hull Street Corridor. Um, okay, thank you. And how about the Henrico people? Um, they, as we went through the, the differences between coverage and ridership in Henrico, um, mostly Henrico staff felt like the ridership oriented investments were the most important ones to make. Um, so when we talked about the Route 7 corridor versus the 14 extension of Williamsburg, um, we talked about that with both the city and with Henrico and they uh, both leaned in the direction of doing the frequency on uh, Nine Mile Road on the Route 7 corridor, as opposed to the extension out Williamsburg. Um, similarly with the Brook Road, the 30 minute service to Parham versus the hourly service to Virginia Center Commons, Henrico staff felt the 30 minute service was, the, was a priority. Um, so in, in Broad Street, they felt 20 minutes was a priority. Um, they did want to try to plan long-term to extend that, to continue to try to extend that to Goochland, to Wilkin, Wilkes Ridge and the new sheltering arms facility, um, but it was not a, an immediate need they felt. And of course that would require some more coordination with Goochland. Uh, you, I, yeah, we might actually uh, get a little contribution from those folks out there at sheltering arms. Um, Julie, if, um, if it got extended out there. <clears throat> okay, um, how about comments on moving, was it three or four routes to 10 minute service? Uh, the, I mean, that's yeah, the a frequency writers... that we did not initially plan with Jared Walker. Right. Uh, we, we looked at 15 minute service as the, uh, as the gold standard for what we were doing. And we moved from 15 to 10 on the pulse at VCU's request. <laughs> 
So the ridership concept included 10 minute service on Route 5 from Carytown through VCU downtown to Whitcomb. And um, staff at the city felt like that was definitely a priority and were willing to make the trades like consolidating the 77 and the 39 as part of that, that trade off between coverage and ridership to, to do that. They felt that that was the, uh, the best way to go. Um, the 10 minute service on Chamberlain and Hall is probably only, um, is very likely only something that could be afforded if you don't do all of this coverage stuff that we're talking about in Chesterfield. So that is the a frequency increase that might be sacrificed if you were to do 90-10 or 80-20 split in, in resources. Okay, uh, well, I don't quite know where to go here. I mean, I, I, you're gonna have a working group on, uh, on Tuesday. I, I, it looks to me like um, we're mostly, most people are mostly ridership, but there might be a fall off to pick up a couple of coverage. Hey, ben, one, one other quick question I had, because kind of my proof of concept of what Chesterfield has done over the past year, year and a half is the Route 111. Um, what is the frequency, I just don't know off the top of my head, of, of that route? Um, I know that it's kind of outpaced our expectations for ridership, especially during a pandemic. Is that route hourly right now, or is that every 30 minutes, every 20? What's the, the current? It's every 30 minutes currently. Okay. And Adrian, what is uh, I know it's outpacing your expectations in terms of daily ridership. What's the actual productivity for that? You know, uh, I don't have the productivity number, but yeah, as far as what the goals were set for Chesterfield, um, it is outweighing that. But com compared to its category, we're hoping that it will increase in terms of productivity overall um, to be compared to the other routes in the future. So looking at routes like um, the 79 and the 18 is what we're comparing it to, so it's not quite at that level yet. So looking at the at that route, the 111, uh, there were several questions about that. Um, one was, um, is there any consideration of adding Sunday service there? And the other is, uh, there was some discussion of extending, or there are two more. One was there was discussion of, of extending it for another mile or two down Route 1. And there was a third question of, um, letting the three be a, uh, a straight single seat ride um, rather than um, stopping it at the, at the uh, grocery store and, and picking up uh, a separate bus. Uh, how about those three considerations? I can cover the first couple. Mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, Monday through Sunday rather than Saturday, uh, as far as the base network, we're considering the 111 as generally um, the same as the base network. So we didn't really have conversations about adding Sunday service. Um, for the majority of that route, um, we would say besides being base network is more of a coverage at this point in time. Um, so looking at that in the future, if there was any funding changes, it would probably be some sort of share between uh, Chesterfield County. Um, as far as the extension, uh, we are still in conversations with Chesterfield. We are actually planning for that. Uh, for our next booking change. Originally, we were going to do a schedule change in May, but just making sure all of the requested rule changes um, related to the union contract are done. We are having our changes now on June 20th. So we're able to uh, hopefully incorporate, we're going to start all the processes that need to be done to incorporate that, of course, and it will come to the next board meeting, um, but would be a one mile extension of the 111 to Greenlee. So that is still planned for hopefully this fiscal year, just making it. Um, and then I'll go ahead and steal the last one. But this one does, the 111 you'll see is an extension of the three in this scenario. So you would end up with that one seat ride. So as far as the productivity numbers, I think this would actually help this route because of the funding sources. We did end up doing two separate routes, not sure how the route would do or um, if funding would be there in the future for it in terms of once the DRPT uh, money uh, ended up ending. So that's what we did in a separate, but the better situation is to have that route connect to the three and this proposal does connect the two. So it becomes a single seat ride in this in both in the ridership proposal. Yeah, in both concepts, yes, right, it, it becomes one continuous route, the right. just the, and the three B all the way down to the we're showing it to the community college. Uh, we, I think we've got to, we've got to sort out exactly if that's still workable. The the one mile extension all the way down to to Greenleaf. Uh, right. I think it may be, um, and this does assume as well 
um, full weekend service in these concepts. For, it does assume yes, Sunday service. Just as assume well. Sunday right. service. Yeah. All right. Um, I will. I will make sure that's right. But I'm, we are the the regionally oriented corridors that we've drawn in both of these concepts are seven day a week service. Um, and uh, so you know that's that's something that we haven't talked about a lot. But you know, for example, the um, the West End today in the West End, the the, the Route 79 that's running every 45 minutes doesn't run on weekends, right, Adrian? I think it doesn't run Saturday or Sunday. Right, yeah, 79 only Monday through Friday. So what is the 79? The 79 is the outer Patterson three chopped route. Um, and I think neither does the 18, is that correct? Correct. So the both of these concepts as drawn assume that this new service pattern of this West End loop that's a combination of those two routes is a seven day a week service. Right. Other questions and thoughts from the members of the board uh, or Julie, if you have some stuff you'd like to say to this. If I may, if, unless there's a board member that wishes to go first. Yeah, that was gonna be my statement. I, I really wanna hear um, you know, more from staff in terms of some of these differences. Yeah. Um, I, as of uh, recently as last week, I was, I have to admit, I was very strongly in favor of the 100% ridership mode. And the early indications that we heard from, anecdotally from staff, uh, from our partners, from our riders, suggested that they were also supportive of that. The information that came back later last week and early this week, in particular, yesterday, and the discussions have had a little bit of a shift in that, which is why we have the recommendation here for the board to kind of encourage us to, to push towards the ridership model, but not necessarily agree to the 100% at this time. To come back on Monday, have a, a special work session where we can go into some of the more details, nuances of, of the trade-offs, as well as the, the policy decision that that we have to face. Um, I think that what's really striking me and giving me pause to consider, like the rest of you, is the Chesterfield area. I think that the in Rico and the Richmond seem to be pretty straightforward, but making the trade off between coverage and ridership as it affects Chesterfield is going to be, a, a, a I think, a, something we need to wrap our arms around and sink our teeth into. I hate to use this metaphor. But <laughs> it's a policy question. Rider, uh, in Rico and Richmond already and have for some time provided a very strong coverage network and ridership network and their local funding with the CVT support will continue to do that. Chesterfield, on the other hand, um, is entering into the provision of transit. And I, I think there, the, the data shows that the proof of concept of the 111, there's a need there. When we look at the the jobs access and the the low income, there's certainly a suggestion that a coverage area is needed there, and that we should be moving forward with coverage in Chesterfield. The really challenging question for this board is going to be: Should the CVTA money be used for that coverage, or should there be a discussion about local funds be used for the coverage and the CVTA stay more towards ridership and how do we balance that for a jurisdiction that is looking to come into the transit um, connection, regional connection, and how that is funded and how that's sourced. And that's, a, that's definitely going to be a hard policy question for this board to tackle. I think that Chesterfield also is considering those policy implications. So uh, I have had to revisit some of my thoughts on it as well just over the last 24 hours. And I, I think that we'll thank have you. to struggle with that next Monday. Um, I recall, thank you, Julie. I recall when uh, some of the strongest um, support for the um, beginning of service in Chesterfield came from uh, Jim Holland, now the chair of the Chesterfield board and the sheriff of Chesterfield, um, because they were concerned about um, no public transit access to the Henrico, um, to the Chesterfield Government Center, which related to persons who'd lost their license and other persons who needed to get to court. 
Um, and uh, obviously, so that's, that's another one I'm interested in at least knowing what people are talking about. That was really important. And it was, it was interesting to see a sheriff come out um, with some uh, deliberate sense of that. Well, how should we, how can we proceed on this so that we can move toward the work session uh, with some good conversation about, about uh, uh, some uh, starting with the basic ridership thing, but looking at some fall offs to that. The other thing we would, I know we would like, and uh, George brought it up. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, um, the there's a there's a racial and income differential in the um, survey results that we got here, and and those are important. Um, and uh, in, the, in the past, nationally, we've seen that. Um, Generally, frequency was something that um, that discretionary commuters thought was far more important than uh, and uh, persons who are bus dependent tended to feel a little more like coverage was more important. I think that's a national um, thing that we've seen. So it's important for us to look at that. And that's why I was asking, are there any particular routes that we know um, people felt that way about? How should we do if this, may, Julie? Yeah. Well, if I may answer that, um, I think that we can certainly dig into that on, on Monday to kind of look at it. When I look at the data and I look at the majority of the respondents coming from the city of Richmond, um, if we dig into it and where the majority of the low income and the minority residents are likely to also have come from and knowing that they already have strong coverage and they have strong ridership, um, I think it, it the sense that they would, we're going to be providing that and supporting that. Uh, over the next today and tomorrow, our local partners will be looking, and Scudder and Adrian, please correct me if I say this wrong, but they're going to be looking at some modified scenarios, a more of a 90 10, and they'll come up with some of that so that when the board comes back together on, assuming that you agree to a special session uh, of the board, special meeting of the board on next Monday you'll be able to look at what some of those trade-offs are uh, between 100% model versus a 90-10, where those are, and we'll have a, a better sense and response from some of our partners on where they land on these issues as well. And we can dig in a little bit more to some of the demographics. I, I, I would remind that while the demographic important is very relevant to understand representation, it is a very small sample. And so I, and the numbers are honestly so close that the graph makes them look like there's a strong difference, but they're all, they're, they're pretty, pretty close in, in where they're falling. Uh, I want to make sure we're sensitive to it, but not overly reactive to it since it, it wasn't a very strong um, leaning one way or another. Do both of the routes uh, go to Jay Sarge? Um... Let's see, one goes up to Parham uh, on, on Brook and the other goes all the way to Virginia Center, Com Com um, Virginia Center Commons. So the, oh, sorry, I just switched there. Um, so if we look at this zoom in a little bit, you can, you can make this out perhaps a little closer. The, um, the 1B every 30 minutes in ridership goes up Brook around the, the, I forget the name is road, but uh, around that Bank of America yeah, right. building gets, gets within about a half a mile of the J Sarge campus. It doesn't go all the way into the campus. Um, and then turns, it turns down Parham to go back to the Walmart shopping center. Um, so it gets within a walking distance. It's not a great walking distance, but it's, you know, it's walkable from there. Uh, the hourly service is drawn in the coverage goes straight up Brook. It does not do that loop. So that would actually be a little bit farther. Um, and the reasoning ultimately for the differences here is um, getting to that Walmart shopping center is obviously very important if we're ending here at Brook and Parham because that's really probably the strongest driver of ridership in this in this vicinity. Um, and we need a reasonable turnaround. With the hourly service going all the way to Virginia Center Commons, um, we we just we need the time to have a reasonably efficient cycle. So I would have thought that time, that um, the community college was would be a strong driver once we have service to it. <clears throat> it it would potentially be, but the challenge is getting in and out of there without without 
it being an inefficient cycle. You know, we're always running into the challenge of how much time do we have before it costs us an extra mm -hmm. bus and to drive over and through the campus and back to the Walmart would cost an extra bus. Yeah, I'm, I'm really familiar with that route. I've driven it a lot um, and we can discuss that some more. Mm -hmm. If I if I may, Mr. Campbell, uh, to Mr. Chairman, all of these are needed. Everything in the coverage and everything in the ridership are needed and, and should strongly be supported. And I, if we had the funding and we had the resources, we would certainly want to put all of these in place, both the ridership and the coverage. The, the struggle is gonna be in the hard policy decision is still gonna fall back to who pays for which of these and how and when how much of the CDTA funding goes into these and how much of local funding needs to come into these and how much do we need to fight for other partnership funding to support them, um, which comes first. Uh, so there's no doubt and no argument that all of these, that they wouldn't be on the table if they weren't all equally important. The question is, is which do we prioritize with the money that we have available and, and who, who comes to the table with that money? Those are the policy decisions that this board will have to address as we move this forward to the CDPA. Of course. Yeah. Hey, um, yeah. Go ahead, Gary. So we're we're going to have a meeting with Chesterfield this week and talk a little bit more in depth around what they're looking for and what they would like in terms of how we approach the situation in Chesterfield in conjunction with everything else. So we'll, you know, we'll be able to come to the work session with some some more depth around that. Good. Do That's these great. decisions affect the city in any capacity, any way? I mean, are we looking at individuals that would, you know, be in the city and yet would take advantage of the ridership of the coverage into these counties? I mean, is the city looking at this in any capacity? I mean, just to have a, a sense of what, what value it may be for them, if any at all. So well, that the time, the uh, Reynolds campus is, um, you know, that is supposed to be the city's, um, uh, you know, community college, and it is not accessible except if you go to the downtown campus and hop on one of their buses. So we've not, uh, and the same. I think uh, I hope that Chesterfield, in terms of any any service that would be paid for out of the CVTA funds, would be something that's linked directly towards city people as well. Um, don't know what a, the um, city staff have definitely been at the table in, a, in our in the working group, Dorana Clark and some of her staff from the new, uh, I think, Department of Equitable Transportation or, or Office of Equitable Transportation, I believe. Um, and yeah, one of the key questions in thinking about the suburban, uh, the, the Henrico and Chesterfield corridors to serve and where we're going out there is certainly what is the access to jobs in those quarters for people from, coming from in the city? Because that is certainly a key um, value to city residents from these extensions and expansions. And I, I think the when we're thinking about the extension in Chesterfield, the Midlothian quarter is probably the most valuable in that respect, because there are so many uh, retail, service, restaurant jobs on that corridor that a lot of people in the city could now get to that they really can't don't have reasonable access to by transit today. So what would be a motion at this point, um, or do you need something? Um, could it be a motion to refer to the meeting on Monday? Um, how would ben, you one do question real, real yeah. quick, just to understand how this may impact our federal participation. Julie, do you know if the federal participation is impacted more by ridership or by miles? And if, if for to say that the ridership example would increase ridership by 5%, and the coverage example would increase our mileage by 5%. Does that impact our federal participation in any way? And which one would make it uh, higher? Sure, uh, the, the federal dollars, um, and Adrian and John actually has been really into this, so they might be able to help me if I, if I misstate. But ridership tends to impact our state allocations more directly because state is an operational subsidy. The federal government doesn't really give us operational money. What they give us is they give us capital money that we are able to flex over for preventative maintenance. So it tends to be more focused on um, the population size, 
as is one, uh, the, the, the mileage that we cover, so the service mileage and those jurisdictions more so than the ridership since it is based, based on those preventative maintenance and capital costs. Adrian, John, if, and, and Scudder, also, if you know, if I miss any of that, please correct me. Um, and the only other variable would be passenger miles. They do look at that pretty significantly. So that's how it's factored in through miles. Yeah, um, there is one small part of the formula that is based on passenger miles, which would, of course, be reflected in ridership terms. So. I think that's. I think that is less than twenty percent or less than fifteen percent of the formula. Most of it is based on population and based on on bus miles traveled, and both of these concepts have similar total miles. So really, when we're looking to get additional subsidies from the federal and the state, it, it, I guess what I'm hearing and what I, my understanding, especially from the state side, is the higher our ridership, the higher we will weight towards that when we're looking at these two. So, um, yeah, excuse me, who? I was saying that was good, that answers my question. Further comments from the board? So Julie, Adrian, Scudder, what do you want from us? If I may, uh, at this <laughs> so originally, I will say that we wanted to come and ask for the policy decision um, to be a fixed policy decision to go towards the 100% the based on the information ridership based on the information that we received late last week, this week, what we're asking for is a rec uh, for the board of directors to approve us moving towards that ridership model. However, uh, and to prioritize that in the discussions with our partners over the next two days, but that we also ask that the board convene a special session next Monday, the 22nd, to be able to go into depth about the recommendations from our staff and make a policy decision at that time. Um, golly, um, I can't rephrase that, um, but I assume somebody's recorded it. Would anybody like to move it? Hey, Ben, it feels like we're just tabling this until a, until a future discussion, which we are scheduling for March 22nd. So I think, I don't know if there's any motion required. Good. I, I think that sounds great. Um, I would like to ask, since you're going to be talking with staff, <clears throat> in my work several years ago with the Fulton people, um, the desire to get a get the um, I, what are you talking about the 14 or it's an extension of a four, but to get the thing going out Winsburg Road was not insignificant, um, and um, I note that uh, that if if that route went out to um, White Oak on 60 um, and the 17 went out to White Oak, the way it goes, um, people get there, um, they have the equivalent of, uh, of 15 minute service from the two. So um, I would just like you guys to check that out again with Enrico and, and Richmond um, to see about that 60, route 60 route, please. Adrian, wink at me or something. Oh, <laughs> yeah. you will check that out, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I guess. Yeah, because well, people told yeah, me that. I, I mean, I sat in hearings on that. Two, two working sessions with them today at one and um, tomorrow at one. So we'll yeah. have a lot more details from them to go over with you guys on the twenty second. If I and one last item about this is that um. According to our bylaws, we are required to put out at least two days notice prior to having a special meeting of the board. Um, I'm, what I'm hearing is that the board is, and Bonnie, you might need to weigh in, do they need to move to have that special session and then we can coordinate the time over the next uh, couple of days to put out notice properly? The, um, I believe you could ask for the special session or the chair could call the special session. It, you just need to be sure that it's advertised as any um, meeting of the board would be. Okay, so I, I call a special session of the board um, for next Monday at a time to be determined uh, by the staff and notified of, to the public uh, in sufficient time to fulfill our legal requirements. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So any further conversation about this? Thank you so much for your work. 
Um, oh. I, I, I just, if I could add, I know that uh, I hate to, to belabor the point. Uh, the, we do have a very short timeline to be able to get this plan together because of COVID, because of the delays in the legislation, um, being able to put some of these policies in place and getting the funding to get this plan together. It, it's been a very intense process to get this right. in place. We're, we're moving towards the goal to get this plan approved by this board through the, uh, with collaboration of Plan RBA and the approval of the CBTA prior to July 1. It's an aggressive goal uh, because this is a new process. It's one that really should take a lot longer. And I want to applaud and, and put out appreciation for Scudder and for Adrian, their staff, as well as our local partners for how much they have really set aside time to prioritize this so we can get it done and make sure that service is not disrupted when we enter the next fiscal year. I would be remiss if I did not extend that appreciation out of acknowledgement to everyone that is making this advance so quickly. And what's also important in this, which um, for the board is that by discussing this, we, we kind of set a ground um, set of policy decisions uh, tentatively so we can learn from it. Um, and, uh, and I think that's really important that we do engage ourselves enough. So we're aware of what this initial discussion has been because this is the first time Metro Richmond's ever done this. And uh, you know, the CVTA is brand new and, and uh, having some sense of what we're collectively about here, I think is really important. All right, any further discussion on that? Thank you. Look forward to the special meeting. Chief CEO's report, I think, is oh no, wait. Uh, federal COVID relief funding for transit in RVA urbanized area. You muted yourself, Julie. Thank you so much, Adrian. I was looking at my notes and not the screen. After a year of this, I still do it at least once a day, put myself on mute and forget to unmute. So uh, in board packet on page 46 and 47, there's a summary of the federal stimulus money, relief money that we have been, um, that we have been receiving since March of 2020 and how we have been allocated or how it's been reserved for allocation uh, to date. I will take this time to briefly go through those different uh, rounds of federal stimulus money and then uh, some of the needs that we have for the use of that money and uh, one recommendation for how to spend it with a, also a recommendation for the board to direct the, us to develop a spend plan outside of the normal budgetary process. So with that, Round one of federal money came from the CARES Act, which was the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. And that came in March 2020, the very early part of the pandemic. This area received almost $36 million of stimulus and relief money that was split with the Petersburg. It came to the region and the 90-10. And that is our normal split with Petersburg, that our urbanized area receives federal money we have a standing agreement with them that the money that does come to us is split 90-10, with GRTC, re GRTC receiving 90%, Petersburg receiving 10%. That means that we did receive $32 million of CARES Act funding in the end of 2020, or fed uh, fiscal year 2020. We allocated a little over 2 million of that for immediate use to go zero fare, as well as immediate use for PPEs, and cleaning of the buses, as well as uh, to use for sick time and quarantine of staff. We budgeted as we went into 2021, $26 million to support operations, specifically to support maintaining zero fares, to maintain the local uh, revenues that we were no longer receiving from Richmond and Enrico, both under the, the shift for the CBTA, as well as because of the economic downturn under COVID. We had a reduction in our budget based on what we would have originally expected. The CARES Act money supported that. It also supported increased natural increases in costs of cleaning the facilities, the buses, 
and the expenses associated with that with CARES, uh, sorry, with COVID over the last year. We also put $3.6 million of that into reserve. Since we did not have a specific uh, plan to spend the entirety of that money, we put the remainder of it into reserve for unexpected expenses. We were pretty sure that the conditions under COVID would change during the course of the year, and we needed to have a certain amount of money left over to be able to react to that. Indeed, we did have one change, and that was the VTU contract. As VTU went out of service and went uh, virtual, many of their riders, their faculty and staff, no longer used the service that, uh, that was being supported to their campus, and they were also impacted by their own economic uh, depression, recession. So we amended that contract and we used the reserve money, the $3.6 million set aside for reserve, to support that change in the contract, which left approximately $2.8 million in the reserve, and that remains unbudgeted. In December of 2020, the very, very end of the calendar year, a second round of federal money was allocated for transit. Our regional area received 3.6 with the 90-10 split. GRTC's, alloc GRTC's allocation of that would be 3.3 million. That also remains unbudgeted. As of last week, uh, the president signed the American Rescue Plan Act, which put another $30 billion of money nationally into transit. The allocation to, the to our urbanized area is expected to be approximately 30 million. We don't have those official numbers yet. With a projected 90-10 split with Petersburg, GRTC would be expected to receive approximately 27 million, again, assuming that our early uh, calculations are correct. Now that's a, a lot of money that is from the federal relief that remains unbudgeted. However, we also still have significant needs because of COVID being an ongoing pandemic uh, and impacts to our staff and our service. Some of those unbudgeted needs that need to be considered are the on-demand transportation for individuals to vaccine clinics, the, uh, the vaccine van, um, it's not the official name, I apologize, it's just what, it's easy, to it rolls off the tongue. We also continue to have uh, the sick and quarantine pay for GRTC employees as well as uh, managing when they have to call out ask the vaccine. I had the vaccine myself last week now that we are eligible and um, while well, I, I wouldn't say I, I was sick, I would certainly say that my arm was notably sore and I understand the second dose of it uh, has put some people out of work for a day or two. We need midday cleaning and disinfecting the fleet. While we have been exceptionally good at getting the cleaning every night on our entire fleet, there is still a call to look towards midday disinfecting of the fleet. We are uh, suffering for a lack of operator relief facilities around the area and the ability of our operators to be able to use the restaurants and the buildings around town. We also know that when we are moving our temporary transfer plaza, we will lose the relief center in the security building as we, we shift. So we need to make sure that our operators have break stations. Our operators also have, and our frontline staff, our mechanics, our supervisors, uh, those members of our team who have worked diligently and dedicatedly for the past year in the face of incredible stress have not received any additional pay for what they have faced coming to work every day. While we have kept them safe, while we have kept um, superior measures in place compared to many people in the region or, the, or, or the, the nation, so we are told, and we have not seen those surges or clusters as significant as some areas in the region and the, the nation have seen with their staff, we have seen a significant amount of emotional, physical, and mental stress on our staff as they have had to face this every single day. Um, there are more and more reports about the, the fatigue, the mental and emotional fatigue being faced by frontline staff, not just in transit, but across the, the nation. And it is with the money that we are, we are receiving, it is proper that we consider another appreciation bonus to that staff for what they have faced over the past year. We know that ongoing zero fares is a consideration 
not just for the safety of our staff from the disease and the safety of our riders for that separation, but also for the economic recovery of our, our riders and the region as we come out of the COVID pandemic and whether or not zero fare should, should remain a permanent part of our system. We also have a, a several pilot programs we would like to put in place to be able to better communicate to our riders on missed trips, missed buses, on-time performance, where we might not have the performance we want. We talked about earlier today that our on-time performance is obviously not meeting our metrics, but how can we better communicate when we have um, vaccine or when we have a uh, quarantine and we have sick outs where uh, we know that a whole series of our employees maybe got the vaccine and so our service isn't great that next day. Or we have another operator or a mechanic or other who's sick and we have to quarantine people around them. Those disrupt our services. How do we communicate that to the public? And we have some ideas around pilots. None of those are budgeted, but they are significant needs that will quickly eat into and use up the federal money. Um, so the recommendation that I'm coming to you with today is that the board authorize, one, a, a higher uh, expenditure towards this vaccine van. Uh, currently, the vaccine van is an on-demand transportation resource that we have made open to the Richmond and Enrico Health District, that when they are making appointments for uh, for people who need additional assistance with their vaccinations. And when those uh, people who are making those appointments note that they don't have transportation and they have uh, limited access to get to transit or no access to transit, that user would be available to get them door to door. I've reached out to, uh, to a couple other of our health districts around us to also provide that. However, until we know how it's utilized, we don't know if this is gonna be a small expense or a large expense. I'm asking the board to uh, consider the uh, expansion of this program, but cap it at $500,000 so that it doesn't become um, an unmanageable expense until we're able to see the demand and come back and develop a plan with board approval that could extend throughout the RVA region. And that the board also direct the CEO and the CFO to consider the remainder of the money and how it should be used and budgeted for the remainder of these and maybe other needs for consideration and adoption in the regular April 2021 GRTC board meeting. Um, I know that was a lot of information and there's a, a lot to digest here, but we don't want to leave this money unallocated and un, um, unbudgeted, which is the reason for coming before you today now that we do know we have this other third round of federal funding coming to us. So could I, thank you, Julie. Can I have a motion uh, so that we can discuss Julie's recommendation? Can I have a motion of these last two things, the vaccine van not to exceed 500,000 and a request to the CAO and CFAO uh, to provide a proposal, uh, proposed budget for the, for the new um, funds from the uh, feds? The move. All right, second, okay. please. All right. Um, <laughs> Uh, my comment is on the latter that um, I have a few suggestions for that latter thing that I intend to submit to the CAO and CFAO, and I recommend that to you all as well. Um, any discussion of these proposals? Hey, Julie, on the, um, the vaccine van piece, as we call it, um, you know, I'm, I'm not personally witnessed the vaccine approach, but I've seen several situations where it's people are in line and they may wait for quite a while. I've seen other, heard of other situations where it's by appointment, it's pretty efficient. Uh, can we work something with the health, um, the health departments to make sure we've got an efficient process to get people vaccinated versus maybe having an inefficient thing where our user driver is sitting in line or is that part of this thought process? Yes, sir, absolutely. So the, the method that we're, we're piloting and it, it, we're learning as we move forward is that if someone calls the Department of Health for their appointment or they're working with the Department of Health because they're having an uh, inability to get an appointment or, or transportation, the, uh, the staff there would then contact user to set up the appointment to get them to the vaccine. Because there's such a wait uh, for some and, and not for others, once they get in line and they're in the process, they would uh, 
they would then notify the staff there um, when they're they're going through and the staff then would call a user to come back so at the most it could be 15 minutes to possibly an hour wait after someone gets their vaccine when user would pick them back up um, but that's going to be we believe the most efficient use since there is uh, an unknown wait through the vaccine vaccination process to be able to get people there and then get them back home without an excessive wait. All right. Other comments or questions on this motion? Uh, it's been moved and seconded that we um, approve up to $500,000 for the vaccine van project, um, which I'm very excited about. Uh, I mean, I, that's exactly what we should be doing. And um, that we also uh, ask the CAO and CFAO to prepare um, a proposal for the expenditure of the additional federal funds that will be coming to us through the latest National Recovery Act, American Recovery Act. Um, you know what I'm talking about. All in favor say aye. Aye. Did I get everybody on that? That was one person. Yeah, okay. We're all together. All right, good. All opposed? It's been passed. Thank you. And CEO's report. Next time we'll harmonize. So you'll know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been in and out because of, uh, I have, uh, I have uh, some people here working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, so I had to hop up every now and then. Sorry about that. I, I, I called Julie this morning and explained it. Good, thank you. Julie, you have a report? Yes, sir. So Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, my reports start with, as always, I hate to say as always, makes it so normal, COVID activity. Uh, GRT cases of COVID have uh, slowed. I hate to say this uh, because I don't want to jinx us. Uh, unfortunately, each time I talk about how well we're doing. Um, I feel like I jinxed it. But I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway because I'm so proud of this. Our cases have slowed since the last board meeting. We actually, right now, as of today, we are at zero active cases, um, which is amazing. I know that we've seen a lot of people who are using the double masking. Our operators are uh, being very efficient in asking people to wear the masks on the buses or not providing service. Um, they're wearing double masks while across the board here at GRTC facilities um, and whatever measures are being put in place across the region seem to have been making a difference with us and we have zero active cases. Staff is actively making appointments as of uh, early last week. The health department opened up to phase 1B in Virginia and through that process transit workers were quickly prioritized to the top of the list. We have people actively making appointments for the vaccine for all of our staff. Uh, we are asking staff to voluntarily provide us updates when they are vaccinated so we can keep a list of it. We do have a common break area where most of our staff spends uh, time either preparing for work during their breaks or if they're on the extra board uh, waiting for service to be called. We had to close that to protect against spread of COVID among staff in the workplace, which meant that at times employees had to sit in their car or outside or find another place to take their break, to start their shift, to eat a meal. Once we have staff well vaccinated, we can open up our break areas again. Um, and I know that everyone is looking forward to having that, not only so they have a place inside to be able to wait instead of sitting in their cars, but um, also on the one snow day that we did have, we delayed service, we had many of our operators come at the same time. And I was here as well to see uh, and to see how much they missed each other when people they hadn't seen for nearly a year because the break room had been closed. Um, I'm very much looking forward to getting that open again. They truly act as a family and work as a family and having not seen each other for a year has been an impact on them. Regarding the vaccine van service, we just talked about it. And although it was just approved, um, just to reiterate, we did partner, partner with the Richmond Henrico Health District to provide these. They reached out to us when they noticed that they had that transportation um, disconnect. And we're very excited about having that and we're very happy that user was so readily available through our contract to be accessible to the health department 
to coordinate those rides and to schedule those appointments. Um, I'm also in conversation, uh, very early conversation with the other health districts to see if we can provide that service there. And Uber has also reached out to suggest that they might be a resource to us as well as we extend beyond our normal district, uh, beyond our normal bus routes, and possibly throughout our region. Uh, that's still very high level. I know that even though we're in Richmond and RICO districts, that some of the appointments they're making extend also beyond the city limits as they get bring people into the vaccine clinics. Uh, so this truly is a regional service. It truly is a partnership beyond our normal boundaries, and uh, it is a high priority that we do this so that transportation doesn't become that limitation to vaccinations and to health. On a different note, um, going towards more of awards and recognitions, I didn't mention this all through the meeting. I couldn't wait to get to this point of the, the meeting to be able to officially uh, recognize Adrian Torres as our new Chief Development Officer. Uh, in her new role, uh, it's a promotion from Director of Planning and Scheduling, she'll be leading the strategic growth of the organization through mobility planning, and stakeholder communications, as well as innovative advancements and investments in technology and infrastructure. It's a big role. Uh, she's really proven herself uh, since I've been here and before I even got here, honestly. Uh, she was well spoken of well before I got here. Um, but she's proven herself to be an uh, invaluable member of our team. And she's forged, forged very strong and trusting connections with our regional partnerships uh, through our regional partners prior to this plan. but definitely throughout this regional plan that we're, we're developing now. So our current leadership structure is set with, uh, for the moment, as the CEO, the Chief of Staff, Cheryl Adams, who's also our acting COO, John as our CFAO, Chief Financial and Administrative Officer, and Adrian Arts as our Chief Development Officer, working under board policy direction to implement regional transit growth strategy. Now, each chief is focused on a core support area for the CEO is focused on the board policy and strategy coordination, as well as regional mobility leadership um, and strategy and policy. The chief of staff, COO, is uh, responsible for the strategy of a safe, effective, and efficient operations and maintenance of our service. The chief financial administrative officer uh, is responsible for the strategy around our finance and our administration, internal administration of our existing and future services the procurement and the human resources. And the chief development officer is responsible for the strategy of our growth, our communications, and our innovation. Um, on the next note, and the final note, is I wanted to also please to announce that GRTC won the Employer of the Year from the WTS, Women's Transportation Seminar, Central Virginia chapter. Uh, this award is given annually to honor an employer who actively supports career development and advancement of women in the transportation industry. So a little bit about GRTC and the women who are here. Uh, while we celebrate all of our employees, uh, to see this level of, of women leadership truly is extraordinary. Uh, starting with the directors, we have nine out of our 12 leadership positions from director up are filled by women. This includes the CEO, the chief of staff acting COO, the chief development officer, the executive director of ride finders, the director of procurement, the director of HR, the director of planning and scheduling, who also uh, is an pro internal promotion, Emily Delroth, a director of marketing, and our manager of first transit. We also have female majorities in many of our major departments, including finance, human resources, planning and scheduling, customer service, procurement, and ride finders. So, you know, throughout COVID, uh, news reports across the country have stated that women have been forced out of the workplace to care for their families as care facilities have shut their doors, um, as employers have laid off staff. GRTC has made it a high priority to provide as much flexibility as possible for mothers and fathers and other family caregivers to give, their, um, to give that care necessary for their loved ones with the assurance that as they gave that care, they would continue to have a secure job and income here at GRTC as part of the GRTC family. So I'm, I'm proud of uh, the entire team. I'm proud of the award and uh, just happy to report that out and to be able to end my CEO report on that note. So Mr. Chairman and members of the board, 
If there are no questions, that does conclude my report for March. Thank you for that, and congratulations on the award, uh, Julie. That's uh, that's really something. Mr. Um, Chairman. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask, is there going to be a, a write-up on that that I can sort of you know, get around on social media um, as well? I'm sure we can. we'll make that happen. Okay. Look forward to seeing it. Great. Thank you. And it is Women's uh, Month, by the way, uh, although it should month. be... That's right. And I'm dying for content. I've got to fill my LinkedIn up with stuff. And I'm like, okay, this is what I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the, um, the only thing I have to note here, apart from just general appreciation of the continued work of all of our um, staff and all the people on this call, um, is um, to note uh, in the first place, congratulate Ad Adrian on her uh, new position. Um, you know, in the world I live in, development officer means you got to raise a whole lot of money. So I'm glad, I'm glad it doesn't mean that for you. In addition to everything else you're doing, but the um, and but also to note that um, that Adrian in particular is really having to, and Julie as well, having to spend a whole lot of time trying to help the CBTA get going and particularly, very importantly, um, to represent um, this institution and its core of knowledge, uh, which is essential to the proper standing up of the CBTA. Um, the, um, so you do, you do a great job. I watch you on a lot of meetings and, uh, and I'm grateful for the, for the skill and, um, and competence that you show in this and the respect you have from your colleagues. The um, discussion of the governance of the CVTA is, is going on, it's hot, um, it's occurring in the different jurisdictions. Uh, there have been interviews of various people and um, our staff at GRTC is attempting to try to make sure that the consultants are able to to operate um, accurately in their description of what's actually here. I, I continue to be uh, helpless and anxious and curious about it. And um, so I'm sure that will continue until they finally come up with a report on, on how GRTC or its successor is to be governed. Hopefully we will be able to secure the advances and strengths of this institution uh, as it has continued to develop um, and, uh, and, and let its strength become a part of the, uh, of the growing regional system that we've all longed for. Any questions or comments? I'm through with that. And we don't have an executive session. So uh, is there any further business? Mr. Chairman, did we approve our minutes? I don't know if we did. I think we did, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Okay. For some reason, I wasn't sure we did. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think we did. Um, yeah. Yes. Anything else for the good and welfare of the operation here? All right. Um, then this meeting of the board of directors of uh, GRTC is adjourned. We have a special meeting to whose time to be determined next Monday.